Good evening. My name is Dan Chartrand. I'm the founder, founder and owner of Water Street Bookstore. And for 28 years, um, the mission of the bookstore has been to build community around the written word. That's it. That's what we do. A vibrant and uh, diverse community around the written word. I just asked the good doctor here uh, what the most fundamental building blocks of life are. And he said, well, it's probably DNA and RNA. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay. So these gatherings across 28 years that you all have been participating in with myself and the bookselling staff, and especially all of our wonderful local authors, that's the DNA and the RNA of the mission. That's how we build this community. So you're all here tonight on a cold January evening, and my heart is full. Thank you all for being here. Paul, thank you for being the reason that we're all here. Please join me in welcoming Paul for you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I'd like to think that maybe it was the poetry that brought you, brought you here, but I, I think maybe seeing so many people that I know that maybe it's kind of a genial guy about town, but whatever brings you here, I hope you enjoy the poetry. Uh, I'm here because I enjoy writing. Hard to believe when I think back on my college days trying to finish those term papers in the middle of the night that I would ever enjoy writing. I didn't seem to so much then, but I do now. Like a lot of people here, probably in the audience, as a young adult, I always thought that I was going to write a book. And we can now. If anybody wants to talk about self-publishing afterwards, I can talk to you a little bit about that. I always thought, thought that it would consist of essays about medicine or the human life cycle that uh, came from my wisdom accrued as a family doctor for 35 years. As a young man, I had admired the writings of the, med the humanist physicians René Dubot, Louis Thomas, and Richard Seltzer. And as an older man, I have admired Abraham Verghese and Atul Gawande. But instead, I've settled on a much easier route, one poem at a time. But we should all be writers, at least in our journals. And if you need a new journal, there's some for sale back there, excellent <laughs> or in letters, if not on paper, at least in well-thought-out emails. For in writing, we organize our thoughts and have conversations with ourselves. We end up smarter and wiser, as we do by reading. And let, let's face it, there is still no better way to read than holding a real-life book in your hands. <laughs> and there are plenty for sale here. May books in this digital world forever be a way in which we share our best thoughts with each other. For me, the human experience has been intimately connected with observations of nature. I've been immensely impacted by living in the four seasons that we can appreciate here in New Hampshire, and by the good fortune of living in a beautiful setting here in Exeter on the tidal Squamscott River. To me, the human spirit comes alive in nature. How barren would our human lives be without nature? It may be as simple as sitting on an urban sidewalk in the sun under a blue sky or a patch of green under a tree, but it must be involved getting, out, getting us outdoors. My first book of poetry, which is also available tonight, Facing the Element, included 52 poems divided into the four seasons with sections winter, spring, summer, and fall. And my new book, In My Life, has four sections divided as nature, humanity, love, and serenity. So let's start with some poems about nature. I've written poems about ice and winter and snow and January cold, but let's get rid of that and let's go right to May. <laughs> <laughs> this poem is called May. Under crystal sky of bird-busy blue, in bud-pink light and early green, the hummingbird returns to feed, and magnolia petals fall like tears of happiness for this abundance. Children swarm the playground like starlings flocking the trees, as leaves open before our eyes, and grass grows an inch each day, making my heart like a bell 
ring for farewell to winter, before quieting in the calm of a languid sunset, where with the fragrance of lilacs I breathe in contentment, as if life never ends. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the um, pleasure of, uh, and, the, and the luck of having a friend, David Weber, who many of you know from around town, retired English uh, teacher, uh, sit down with me when I was trying to pull together my first book, and I appreciated his feedback, and I was a little surprised when he said, I like your rhyming, because I didn't think I was rhyming, and I don't, <laughs> I don't go out intending to rhyme my poems, that's not the way I start, I'm intending to be as lyrical as possible, but in being lyrical that rhymes often come, or near rhymes, and so I, I look for the flow and I look for the, the sing, singing. Um, I've been a French horn player for a long time, and getting the, the breath and the phrasing uh, for, in a poem is important to me. Uh, this next one is called Time to Bloom. We'll stay with the, the bright, sunny springtime uh, theme for a little longer. Time to Bloom. Today's the day your buds are lush, they've captured what your love entrusts, for desire has traveled in your veins and sweetly packaged what remains. From roots well planted in the ground, with sunshine laughing all around. So release your grip and let it slide, relax your petals to the side. Let your pollen catch the wind or little feet of dancing bees. It's time to bloom and let it shout. It's time to let the beauty out. Mm -hmm. Not arriving. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one of the settings in nature that we enjoy very much is getting down to Sanibel Island. And I enjoy getting on the beach. And those of Facebook friends of mine will remember all the sunrises that get posted on Facebook mm -hmm. from Sanibel. Okay. And I brought this. Uh, shell that I found in Sanibel uh, called a fan shell and once you find one of these and I was lucky to found, find two of them so my wife Jane and I each have a lovely necklace from these shells you get a little hooked on trying to find more and they're hard <laughs> to find <laughs> they're literally one in a million I promise you I see at least a million shells uh, looking for a shell like this but anyway this poem is about that called findings I am not a fisherman, but I think I know the idea. Put yourself out there, like a bob on the line, and give it time. When I search for shells, I put myself out there, walk the beach with the tide, and give it time to make the find, knowing for sure it will come. The same is true for life in general. You must know when to search, when to rest, when to trust in fate, and put yourself out there. You can't come, just come for 10 minutes and leave, but if you walk the beach enough, the dolphins will come. If you rise early enough, the black skimmers will greet you. If you go out each day, you'll sometimes own the beach alone. If you look long enough, that shell will rise to meet you. <laughs> Uh, so, as I said, I broke, the, broke these 100 poems into four sections, um, one of which is called Humanity. Um, a lot of my poems, even talking about humanity, have elements of nature in them, but this one doesn't have too much. But it's suitable for February in, in New Hampshire. It's called Election Day. <laughs> Day breaks damp in the morning chill. Best to bring an umbrella and dress in layers for a long day holding signs and cups of steaming coffee as feet stomp to keep toes warm and familiar names in bold print bob in dueling colors above wooden sticks for voters walking the gauntlet of democracy, <laughs> seeking admission to curtained booths of hope. And having cast my humble prayer, I come down the concrete steps a hurrah for civil discourse in my heart, to find the sun breaking through the clouds on this 
my favorite day of the year. Mm. <laughs> a little odd to think that election day would be my favorite day of the year, but I really have that enthusiasm and that belief in humanity when a society gets together and uh, allows an open election to things. Um, one of my mentors at one point gave me a compliment that I, I was sort of my favorite compliment I've, I've gotten. He said, I'm a little D Democrat. <laughs> I'm also a big, big D Democrat, but a little D Democrat that believes that we all have our right to say our piece and we, ha we should respect others' beliefs. So uh, after the last election, I printed up a bunch of purple t-shirts that said November 8, 2016. <laughs> November 8, no hate. And I really believe it's important that we try to keep vitriol out of the civil discourse as much as possible. Of course, on the back, it pointed out that Hillary, it was the, the vote totals. Hillary, three more million votes than Donald Trump, but oh well. It is what it is, right? Stay active, stay involved. You probably haven't stood there often enough as a candidate. That's the problem. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Get have less time to work. <laughs> So this is one um, also about humanity, but it's in the nature section, about good memories, called Sculling the River with My Daughter. There won't be another day quite like this one. Emotional. The morning light through the trees just so, and the tide rising to here and now. Stroke matching stroke. We pulled our oars through the summer-warmed water. Dragonflies darting between us and heron watching from the shore. As I look back as through a window at the dock from which we've just come, water slowly dripping down my long oars, I press this precious moment to my heart, and it becomes a part of me. Mm. <laughs> I'm a softie. <laughs> so let's find something more. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I hope many of you, or most of you, or all of you have been to Bedrock Gardens. Raise your hand if you've been to Bedrock Gardens. Okay. It's one of the true gems. Have you not been there? Oh my God. Take a day off. <laughs> not in, not in <laughs> no, no, in the summer. Bedrock Gardens has been this initiative of Jill Nooney and Bob Munger out in Lee uh, at their farm, now garden, public garden, uh, that they've created as a public space and offered up to the public. And please get there. Uh, it's not only a beautiful garden, uh, it also has uh, Jill Nooney's amazing uh, sculpture art, um, a lot of uh, welded materials of old, old metal and found objects, but it's absolutely amazing. Anyway, this poem is about bedrock gardens. Um, there's a lot of words sort of halfway, two-thirds the way through that people don't quite understand, but that's the names of, uh, when you don't understand the words, those are the names of some of uh, Jill's uh, sculpture running together. Bedrock gardens. First must come hands in dirt and knees on the ground, before in sun and rain and time, each shoot can rise, and plant line meets sight line along path meeting path. In sublime meander among sturdy sculpture, built fire and might from the scraps of generations. Totem silhouette, peace flora blade, bugs balancing gem medallions, feather and arrow catching dreams divine, and ferocity in fantail victory the trickle of water celebrating below the meditation hut, these elements of serenity shared with dragonfly and frog and rabbit and undoubtedly before sunrise a deer drinking in the beauty before I rise to do the same. So there's a lot of things to love about life, especially when you're retired. <laughs> And this uh, poem, some, some poems come to you pretty quickly and pretty readily, and other ones you're pulling teeth. Um, but all of them, to me, uh, Robert Frost once said that a poem arises in the throat. Uh, to me, uh, a poem arises in the chest, 
but it's about some some moment where you have some emotion or some feeling that you decide to try to put down on paper. But um, one of them, uh, for my Facebook friends, I just put on uh, today, I think, mm -hmm. a poem I wrote yesterday. Uh, I'll read it at the end because it's not in this book, but it's uh, something of uh, things to come. But it was about uh, going out and pruning the, the apple trees in my yard. But anyway, so they just have this moment that you try to express. Anyway, I think this one uh, was not pulling teeth. I think this one came pretty readily. It's called, I Love That. I love that no matter how early I arise, the flowers are there to greet me. No matter how restless my sleep, you are there when I awake. No matter how far it had to fly, the monarch flirts my garden. And no matter how long they are gone, our children return to play. Today I will go about the meadow, walking more slowly and stiffly than I would like, to breathe in the colors of the fall, absorb the sparkle of the golden grasses in the sunshine, and allow my heart to follow the thistle down as it lifts off in the breeze, searching for new ground to seed. <laughs> The other place that Jane and I have enjoyed vacationing, uh, in addition to, uh, to Sanibel, is Sedona, Arizona, and some beautiful Navajo <laughs> jewelry. Um, and this one uh, I wrote after walk, taking a hike in an area there called the Canyon of Fools. Do people know Sedona? It's Red Rock mm -hmm. country and land of uh, magical uh, places, magical colors, and spiritual vortexes. Another great place to go for the sunrise. Uh, it's called the Canyon of Fools. Go deep in the earth of my red rock valley, my chalky vein of prehistoric life. Climb my steps of genial limestone and rise like the sun in the desert blue sky to dance with the birds in the mountain cedar or bask like a lizard in the rabbit brush. But do pause to study my shadow-edged cliffs, for they have stories of deep time to tell and glimpses of what the future may hold. Like the divergent veins of the sycamore leaf, your path is of your own choosing. Mm Uh, next poem um, was, again, something fun for me to write and came pretty uh, readily. Uh, I was thinking about the days of the week and how they each have their own meaning to us. Monday, <laughs> going back to work, Friday, <laughs> Saturday. So I thought Thursday deserved a poem. And this is my poem called Thursday. The penultimate day of the week, and also a British detective, you're almost there, but not complete. Just tired enough to know the difference. Not yet worried about packing up or putting on your best clothes. A nice night out for dinner or a movie before the weekend crowds. You've made your trip to the market and stocked the fridge, perhaps finished a load of laundry and paid the bills. We live our lives forever on a Thursday, feeling like we've done a few things but never really thinking we've reached the end. <laughs> There's a lot of aging and retiring in this, in my poetry, because I am aging and retiring. Uh, you know, I really respect the life cycle. Uh, you don't get out of life alive, let's face it. So I hope we can all age <coughs> gracefully. I won't read you my poem, Aging, but it's a fun one. It's in here. <laughs> Another great place to travel, Paris. Jan and I had a nice trip to Paris a few years back, and this poem resulted. Paris. Your boulevards like ticking hands of a busy clock. Your river a slate brushstroke past islands of history. 
Your streets cobbled by the desire of generations, still spilling its youth onto your caves. Your markets teeming with the colors of life, and your gardens rich with civilization. But your churches are the hidden heart of you, rich in silence, and still portal to the eternal now. One of my favorite uh, memories of Paris was going to a service in Notre Dame, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and they didn't let tourists into the central nave where the wooden ornate uh, benches are and stuff. I forget the name of that in the cathedral, but unless you went to a service, so they went to a service, and it was just lovely with singing, and you, to be in a cathedral like that and have a sacred place all to yourself is pretty special. So if you get to Paris or similar cities, Check out the churches and think about going to a service and listening to the music. It's just magical. Another place that really um, has its own power, uh, just non-verbally, uh, power of presence. Um, my wife Jane is very good about picking up about the spirit of places when we travel and instinctively sense their histories and the, the human lives that came before us. But I certainly had that feeling when I went to Gettysburg and the battlefields. I had the opportunity to go <coughs> with an <coughs> old friend and his wife a couple of years back. <coughs> and this poem resulted. Gettysburg. Morning breaks gray on the battlefield as we venture forth to taste the waters of history. Fog hanging as if from campfires along the ridge in the hush of this open-air cathedral. How rude to drive a car along this sober, ex somber expanse of mortal endeavor. Best to walk or ride a horse, though a bicycle will do. Following the dust of a hundred thousand men marching, cannon, cannon everywhere, as ghosts two rows thick step into the grassy fields, exhorting onward sword held high, stepping over ball-shattered bodies one imagines gloves and satchels and epaulets still layered on the ground. Then the quiet of night, spring peepers estimating the groans of fallen men, before in rosy dawn the smell again of campfires and bacon grease filling the air with almost, almost done, almost survived, almost won. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my patients uh, was a real Gettysburg uh, fan and went back every year um, to visit there with his buddies uh, and he really enjoyed that poem uh, and resonated with it, with it which made me feel like I had hit, hit a nail and felt good. Everybody good? I can keep reading? Yeah. I won't read all of them. Uh, I guess I'm sort of a simple poet in that my poems are all pretty short. I only can remember one poem other than one I wrote for my father that went on a bit, but um, that was more than one page, and I wrote it for my uh, son's wedding. It's in the first collection called The Meadow, but that went through how the meadow evolved through the seasons, so it had to be a little longer, but... Some of my poems are really short. I think there's one in here called Retirement that you want to check out that's really short, but it's fun. <laughs> um, so, another one about time passing, huh? Stay on theme there. Every day we bathe. Every day we bathe in time and wash away another layer of ourselves. Those daily moments that settle like dust on our stories, like the dust I wipe from the frames of old pictures on my shelves. Where younger versions of ourselves stare back as if distant relatives, amusingly recognizable, yet no longer us. Like remembering a field that is now a house, a path that is now overgrown, or a beach that has washed away. <clears throat> so I hope that 
uh, most people here have their rituals of getting out in nature. I know looking out there that uh, a lot of you I know do, and that's great. One of, one of my rit rituals is trying to get to the beach for sunrise. And I wrote this a poem uh, a year ago, one morning after going to the beach, called Driving to the Beach, 5 a.m. Bird song laughs me eastward, past silent church and fire station, and steam rising like gray smoke from the old schoolhouse furnace, as I head to the beach in the early morning light. My mind is still in bed, whispering to my dreams, but God's paintbrush is moving fast, so my body with coffee beside me is in motion too, to catch her in the act painting rose above the purpled light where sky meets sea. Mm. Today is Sunday and it's not yet summer, so I have the roads and the beach to myself. Even the gull churning his wings above the beach is alone. Why do I do this? Why do I want to embrace this new day as if it were something special, when it is just one in a row of many, not yet warm enough and still too gray? because I have landed here, because I have plopped down in this world that keeps coming at us, whether we like it or not. So serve it up and strike the ball and put it in play. Mm. <laughs> so back to rhyming, accidental rhymes or fortuitous rhymes. Say yes. <clears throat> sing, sing for a life well lived, a rainbow of pleasures, a basket full of woe, an intimate gift down a garden path, which we would have missed if we hadn't said go. So say yes to the heartache, say yes to the pain, say yes to adventure and discover the gain. Stoke the fire while the flame is high in its hearth, Soon enough will come embers in a time to depart. <laughs> Another fun one. The Miracles of My Life. Healing, growing, waking up each day, my children, our children, baby birds at play. Sunshine, thunderstorms, the greening of the field, Rising bread, tasty wine, lovingly made meals. Touching base by telephone with loved ones far away. Finding open blossoms and inviting them to stay. Morning light, daydreams, twinkle of a star. Flashing aspiration of a firefly in a jar. So this book is dedicated to my wonderful and beautiful wife, Jane, so it's time to bring one of the poems about her in. <laughs> in Search of Beauty. In Search of Beauty, I watch my wife enter the room to rearrange the flowers she's just picked in our garden. Blessed with morning light, elegant in all her years, ripe with the day. The windows lay open to the late September sun, where tomatoes still ripen on the vine, and life still forages in the field not yet mowed. At this moment, before breakfast, all life is in the palm of my hand, and like the birds chattering in the hedges, I pay no mind to the coming chill of autumn nights. Mm. So speaking of books and other more modern forms of communication, the digital age, the short texts, the email only written from your iPhone and not from a computer. <laughs> At least Jane and I have discovered dictation into our iPhones. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is about the modern era and missed communication. Word came on the internet, wireless, ether, Wi-Fi, 
without face, inflection, or context. What were you thinking? Don't you know how I feel? So we entered the Shostakovich symphony of human emotion, and I pulled up a chair to begin tuning the static into usable wavelengths of genuine conversation. <laughs> I'm not on Twitter yet. Hopefully I never will be. It's just the idea of, of doing a nation's business by Twitter is just such an anathema. Oh, well. Where is Abraham Lincoln and Barack Obama when you need them, huh? Uh, okay. Um, Raise your hand if you're a member of a book club. Uh, about a third at least, maybe maybe 40 percent. Anyway, you should be. Uh, if you are a member of a book club, you uh, can get a discount here. If you order your books through the bookstore, I recommend you check it out. I've been a, a member of an amazing men's, Exeter Men's Book and Social Club for almost 25 years. There are a few members here. Thank you for coming. And a shout out to Chris Baker, Dr. Baker, Chris Baker, who pulled us all together uh, to start that many years ago. It was at a point where I was so busy in my medical career, I was not reading many books. But at being in a book club and having a book a month to crack uh, is a good way to really get out there and, uh, and learn some things. Anyway, this is from my book club. Cold book club. Considered, thoughtful, the men drift in and the circle fills, greeting and well-wishing as bottle tops snap and wine corks pop, entering a fold of genuine respect for the sheen worn by each of us from decades of trying, building and caring and doing. The books are dropped on the table or floor and the torch passed round. Each knows the work of being a partner, a parent, a citizen of this crazy world. And though we stand to a man, each knows the death of a father or the father of a friend. Chiding and teasing and disagreement weave into our fabric, but it is love that binds us together. Uh, I had the pleasure of recently being in uh, Switzerland with an old old friend who's uh, moved there and become a Swiss citizen. This next one's about Vermont, but I'm thinking of the, the ways that Vermont and Switzerland are similar. Uh, land of valleys and mountains, the ones in the Alps higher than the ones in Vermont, but the same idea of these valleys that take, uh, take quite a while to get into one looks at the map and say, oh, this isn't very far between those two places, but when you got to go up and around, <laughs> they can be a far away apart. Anyway, and Switzerland, of course, is uh, one of the oldest democracies in the world. Uh, starting, um, the cantons came together, their, their little bumper sticker on the car is, is CH, it's not S or SW, CH for Confederation Helvetica, when the cantons were pulled together a, bunch of farmers for self-protection and what have you. Of course, they came late to getting the vote to women. <laughs> the cantons can be pretty independent sometimes. It's much like the United States, but one of the cantons didn't give the vote to women in the local elections. They had to in the federal elections because of federal law, but the local elections, the women didn't get the vote to, wait for it, 1971. <laughs> okay? Anyway. Uh, it feels like Vermont, maybe that's why the uh, traps when they left Austria in World War II settled yes, up in Stowe. And, uh, there certainly were views in Switzerland that reminded me of uh, Stowe and the Trap Family Lodge. This one's called Vermont Lessons. Choose your valley and settle in, then stick around. There's another one next door if you need the change, but you'll bring the same problems with you. The earth loves you. The apples need picking, and the deer expect company. Mm -hmm. The seasons will come and go and pay you no mind. The mountains will change color too, but keep their shape. Only you will look different year to year. <laughs> uh, 
my last section of the book is called Serenity, and this poem about the Grand Canyon mm. fell into that section. It's called On the Rim of the Grand Canyon. Speak to me, rock temples, whisper in the wind of your timelessness, or show me in your weathered face, tinted with desert varnish, that age becomes beauty, and I should not fear my fleeting presence here, as a grain of sand doubts not its contribution to this splendid universe. Mm. Mm. As you see, my poems tend to be short, but hopefully mm. short and sweet. Mm. Uh, I have poems in here about my cancer and my cancer journey that Jane helped me through so lovingly. Um, I'm not going to read one about that specifically, but this one uh, I wrote when I was sort of recovering, and uh, it's called Imperfection. Also about shells, but finding imperfect ones. Imperfection. This year I went out after the storm in my scarred, imperfect body to walk amongst the spent, broken shells on the beach. Other years I'd find a perfect shell, radiant, proud, waiting for me in the blend of two worlds where sea meets shore. This year I must settle for the battered, the worn, the imperfect shells that scatter the sand clinging to the wet in forlorn abandonment. This year I gratefully finger the ragged and pocked fans, fan shells, that stumble my way. How humbly I accept my new station, glad to be here on the beach again, glad to be in my unique self. <clears throat> Two more poems and then we'll take a break. Another one for Jane. Mm -hmm. The Gift. The two halves of sorrow parted, and there you stood, embroidered in godfulness, open, seeking, listening, offering. You did not settle easily, but stayed curious to my desires, guarding your intimacy while slowly opening your heart, elegant and poised, wearing carefully your Dagod dancer's body, you were open to explore marriage in an Ecuadorian cloud forest, two-stepping our meld before full throttle holding me through my hour of need, giving, always giving, the gift of you to me. Stumbling, I found you, found you over my obstinacy, and am blessed for it. Reading me without words, you guide me to the voice of love. Mm. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of love, this is called The Love That Speaks to Everything. <clears throat> I am the daughter that God searches when he's lonely. I am the wind that touches all the grasses of the field. I am the turning of the earth upon its axis, and the tears a mother cries for her lost child. I am the dust trod by feet of homeless masses, dispossessed by evil masters gone to war, and their warm embrace into a land of plenty by a people grateful for the things they have. I am the timeless flow of energy between all things, the dancing particles announcing each and every atom. I am the blanket that covers all the night. I am the potential for all things, the breath of God, the love that speaks to everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Entertain any questions if there are any. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> yes.
Yes. I'm just Kathy. curious, do you write your poems freehand or do you type them? Good question. Uh, to me, it works better to use longhand in a journal. I always start that way. Um, and then when I feel pretty good about it, I find that when I type it up is another good time where edits come naturally to me. So I, I like both steps, but I think with a pen in my hand still. You know, that's the way my brain developed, I think. Yes? Have you always liked poetry, and when did you write your poetry? Mm. Yeah. Good question as well. Uh, I enjoyed po Repeat the question. Uh, have I always liked poetry, and when did I write my first poem? Mm -hmm. My first poems were signed to me in high school, of course, by the English teacher. I still have a couple of them. Uh, one was started something like, I am the rock that rests upon the shore, the mighty waves, you know, I was, you know, it's like that Paul Simon song, I am the rock, that was <laughs> my high school persona, but anyway. Um, so I wrote some, some decent high school poems back then. Uh, then I did not write any poems uh, for many years. Um, you know, a doctor does a lot of writing in, its own, in his own way. So when I say I enjoy writing, I think I sort of in, learned to enjoy writing because a doctor has to do all this documentation. And especially if you're taking care of adults or complex patients with a differential diagnosis, and you sort of have to make a case for why this is your diagnosis and what you're doing. So I sort of got into that a little bit. So that was my writing for many years. But uh, make a long story short, my first wife developed cancer. And the per first poem I had written for 20 years, 25 years, um, was a poem about that. It was called... Uh, um, infirmary, subtitle, Chemotherapy Blues, and it was about our experience going to, to chemotherapy together. Uh, and that's in my first collection that's here tonight. Um, uh, but, yeah, it's something I've come to enjoy. And, and, and again, thanks to Jane, who uh, offers these magnificent listening circles in our home of meditation. And that's a time where uh, self reflection and uh, messaging comes to one and a number of the poems have sort of got started in that venue as well um, but you know that now it's that if I have an aha moment at the beach or trimming the apple trees as I was this week I'll read you the one I wrote yesterday uh, that's been edited a little bit with some feedback from my Facebook friends but anyway <laughs> Uh, it's called Pruning in February. Poetic license. I know it's not February yet, but almost. <laughs> almost. It sounds better than pruning in January, let's face it. <laughs> pruning in February. One goes about it slowly and gently. I'd like to say thoughtfully, pruning the fruit trees in winter. Only fitting in this season of hiding and hibernation, of holding inwards and surrender. Angling my ladder into the branches, I climb intimately among them, twisting and reaching to clip the errant roots. Some slide to the ground unaided, and some need the tips of my loppers to loose them from the melee. Each snip goes smoothly, and I am surprised how green and pliant the boughs remain in the frozen air, proving their vitality is only dormant. After, I pause to admire the symmetry of each tree. I wonder if the brethren boughs now scattered on the ground are missed already, or if they cry out as lost children wrenched from their sustaining teat. I decide to leave them as they fell, so they can say a proper farewell to the mother ship. I will rake up their dry bones in the spring and give them proper disposition. Mm. <laughs> so it, it can get fun. Mm. Eric, you had a question? Yeah. Do you sit down to write poetry without the idea first, or do you follow an inspiration that happens randomly? Well, the inspiration always comes first for me, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was thinking about that, you know, thinking about writing and thinking if I were teaching writing. I think it is possible to be given an assignment, write a poem about an apple. You know, and uh, I'm sure that teachers do that and create a writing.
courses. I've never actually taken one and never taught one, but but I, I think I could do that at this point. But it would it's a lot more fun to wait for the inspiration. So that's what I do. Yeah. So yes, Lucian. Paul, when, when uh, you come first with the inspiration, uh, remind me what you said earlier, comparing uh, how you write. You say your poetry comes from the chest. Chest, yeah. And Robert, uh, Robert Frost comes from the throat. throat. Yeah. I resonate better with what you what you do. You know, you <laughs> mm -hmm. come from the chest. Yeah. And also, the uh, Wordsworth says that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of uh, powerful feelings. Mm. Oh. That resonates very well with me. So, can you explain? I never heard about Robert Frost when he said the poetry comes from the throat. What does he mean by that? When it comes from the throat. Yeah. I think he meant from a lump in the throat is the way I understood it, you know, from a lump in the throat. He has a cough out? <laughs> uh, well, that, that need to say something, that emotional upwelling, uh, you know, I, maybe he even said, I don't have the exact quote with me, maybe he even said it comes from a lump in the throat, he probably said that, from, and he, for me it's a lump in the chest, but yeah. Yes, well, do you carry a little notebook around with you? No. no. Uh, you know, uh, we have our iPhones. There have been occasions where I've been like That's walking true. on the beach like or someplace and I have to pull out the, the notes and, and dictate just because I don't want to lose a line or two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've done it that way, mm -hmm. but no, I'm, I don't carry a pad around, paper around with me. No. And there are spells where I don't write any poetry for quite a while. Um, it, it depends on a lot of biorhythms and emotions and what else you're doing. Yes, Molly. Have you thought of, for your next book, also um, including your photography with your poetry? Um, yes, I've been encouraged to do that, and I, as you know, I enjoy taking photographs. The trouble is that it's easy to put together a book like this in black and white and print yeah. it up inexpensively. When you get into printing photography, unless oh, you have a good friend who <laughs> does that for a living, it gets very expensive very quickly and you ask, have to ask people to, to, uh, to pay a lot. So the answer mm. is Facebook, Facebook, where the beautiful pictures can go on for free mm. and the poems can go along with them. So stay mm -hmm. tuned and that's where I put my photos to match my poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for doing that. Sure. Yes, Eric. Typically, how much editing do you do after you write a poem? And do, do you can you sit down and crank a whole one out at a time, or? Uh, rarely do you do a poem that doesn't need some editing at some point. Even if you think it's it's damn good and you like it, you come back to it. You need to let it sit for a while. Um, and when you come back to it, I find that uh, that there's uh, some editing. So, uh, and this book of poetry took quite a while for technical reasons. I couldn't get the person I wanted to format it for me, so it took much longer to get out than I expected. It was really ready a lot sooner. Um, but then you appreciate a chance to go back after letting it sit for a while. It's like, like a good loaf of bread, you got to let it sit and rise a while and come back to it and eat it again. we got a, another great poet in the back row there. Bob, what do you feel about that? The, the poems just come in or do you, ha how does the editing uh, process work with you? Bob Moore. Stand up, Bob. <laughs> It's a uh, poet's sort of, I don't know, I feel it as a little bit of a duty to do that. Um, I like form. I, I, I was always kind of, uh, I was always kind of found form comfortable. And so I, I worked with structure for a long time. And then I, but I love Mary Oliver's poetry uh, and I love a kind of a, a free flowing natural language type mm -hmm. of, and I've been experimenting with that for the last year or so. Um, I, 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 after I'm pretty satisfied with the poem, I give it to my wife to read. Yeah, and, wives uh, are very good at yeah. <laughs> so, And she, uh, when, if she actually reads it and she says, "Don't please don't touch that poem," I, I sometimes a little bit nervous about that. Uh, but uh, I do actually take it and I still look at it a couple more times. So I think the poem is really never done, um, but um, I give it at least a couple of weeks and sometimes. A month, maybe a couple of months, and then uh, 
I think after a while you're satisfied. But you can come back to a poem a year later and you don't want to make any changes, then you know it's done. Right. But sometimes it takes a year. <laughs> okay. Thank you. There's more wine and cheese in back, I think. So please help yourselves. And Dan's not going to kick us out for a few more minutes, right? Not at all. Okay. Um, you're willing to sign books for folks? Sure. Thank you all for being here. Paul, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.